Joining me in studio, candidate for District 4, Lubbock City Council, Steve Massengale. Welcome back. Chad, thanks for having me. Absolutely. Uh, campaign's going well. It is. It's, 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 it's been going great. It's uh, the reality sinking in that we're two weeks from. Yeah, we're well, in early voting next week. I mean, early it's, voting it's starts nuts. Monday, and uh, I guess this Saturday marks two weeks from Election Day. So May yeah. is upon us, and, uh, you know, the time is now. Yeah, and, uh, of course, there are a lot of issues out there. Uh, last night, uh, you and uh, you and your opponent, current Councilman Girl T, uh, uh, y'all had a forum last night. Yes. Uh, one of the issues that uh, was brought up uh, last night that I, I, I kind of want to get into uh, is this uh, the the Omni building and and you know y'all y'all been going kind of going back and forth on this right uh, over you know what the future should be uh, it sounds like he is all for everything the way it's gone and that you know we're, we're going down this road it needs to continue if you're elected or you're on the council let's say uh, should this issue come back up. And be resent or, or I guess sent to the voters, or should we just say, okay, we're going to continue down the path that we're on right now, but we're not going to do another project like this? You know what I hear from from voters as as we campaign is that people want input on large projects and um, the Citizens Tower project on whether I mean I don't know if we're in a, at a point where you could I don't know I mean they that I know that that boat is. I mean, it's sailed. I don't know what you can do to unwind it, so it's difficult for me to answer that question maybe until I'm there. Yeah. But, you know, I think if there are other alternatives uh, to look at once I'm elected to the council, I think you have to consider that. What concerns me most is a project with an undetermined cost. And so that, that, that in and of itself may trigger us to sit back and say, what really have we committed to here? Is that, though, with every project that a city or even a private company is going to get into, isn't there some undetermined cost? Or are you talking about setting, hey, here's the top line, we're not going to go above it? Well, I think that's a great point you make because you'll have a much better perspective of cost if you do all of your due diligence and engineering and architectural studies before you make the decision. So it's kind of like we're going to buy a car and we're going to um, refurb it. And we're just going to go and start now and we're just going to pour money into it until it's done rather than saying, okay, let's sit down and say this car needs paint, this car needs tires, this car needs a new dash. Let's get estimates and bids from all those. And then say before we buy this car for X amount of dollars, we also know we're going to put an extra $5,000 in it. Now we'll make our decision. We don't have that information. We really don't even know what the thing looks like yet. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we haven't seen the full study on whether or not it will fully accommodate the city's needs. So, yes, I think you could have handled this in a way to to say, look, this is going to cost X. Um, this is the purpose. And then I think you could have – if you tell that story and communicate clearly with voters, I think that um, – you know they'll let you know if the, if they support uh, your your initiative. I think the other thing that's important to talk about here is, I think there's there is or an idea that's come up in the campaign that there is a fear of how voters would would rule on this, and mm -hmm. and I don't think that's a great way to maneuver because again, if you're transparent and you tell the story and you're making intelligent decisions. I find that if it's a need, that the voters would support that. I mean, I think you just have to tell the story. But I think to get in a situation to say, we're going to commit to COs on this project because we're afraid of the voters, I think that's a dangerous path to follow. Well, and, and what it tells, you know, that, that added, and I, I've said it from day one, that I, I hate the attitude of if we put it to the voters, they're going to vote it down. So we're going to go ahead and do it because that tells me you really don't care what the voters say anyway. You, you don't care about the voters uh, I, I think if you would have put a police station up for a bond proposal or to the voters, I, I think overwhelmingly voters would say yes to a new police station. I agree. And a, a new city hall, I don't know about. I think they could have included the fire department, the f new fire station in yeah. there, and then you could have gone out with GOs rather than COs. We're talking about general obligation bonds rather than, uh, rather than COs. And 
Uh, I, I completely agree. The other thing on the on the citizens' input side is there's a lot of people frustrated, and this applies not only. I'll include the Citizens Bond Advisory Committee in this. And then we've also seen how uh, recommendations from the Annexation and Growth Committee were received by the City Council is we, we ask these citizens to come in and we want their expertise and we want them to spend their time and effort on making a recommendation because th- those jobs don't pay well. Mm-hmm. And, and, and then in the, in the Bond Advisory Committee, if, if you'll recall, there was never a recommendation for a new city hall. Right. But there was recommendation to, for facilities for public safety. Mm-hmm. And then what we did is we went ahead and t- uh, moved on, C- did COs on that. So I think there are ways that if you do your homework and then you communicate clearly to the voters, I think you'll find that they support, if that project's worthy, they'll support it. Yeah. Uh, visiting with Steve Massingale, candidate uh, for Lubbock City Council in District 4. Uh, a, a candidate in another race has brought your name up, uh, this time on Facebook. And, and this was a couple of days ago. Victor Hernandez bringing mm-hmm. you up, linking you and Dan Pope, uh, and asking the question in a way uh, of asking if, if you are an investor in this uh, investment group in downtown Lubbock that has uh, maybe 40 different people who mm-hmm. have shares in, in this investment deal in downtown Lubbock. Uh, he's been raising the question that, hey, if you're part of the investment group, uh, talking about Dan Pope and yourself, mm-hmm. if you're part of this, you're going to profit off of downtown Lubbock. Now you're going to be on the city council. Is there a conflict there? Number one, are you part of the investment group? And is that a conflict of interest? Uh, I am not part of that investment group. I'm aware of that investment group, but I, I, I think their intentions are good. Uh, I do own property in downtown. My, my property is actually east of I-27. If you consider that downtown, it's kind of adjacent to the depot district. But, uh, yeah, I think that I think that you have to consider your position on that if you're elected. And if you are part of that group, you probably should consider um, separating yourself from that group. But I, I believe Mr. Pope has acknowledged that – if he's yeah. elected, that he will do that. So, yeah, I think that is um, – I wasn't aware that Mr. Hernandez had called me out on Facebook recently. I, under, I know he's <laughs> called me out before. But just to clear the air, um, I am not part of that ing- investment uh, just group. Had, just had to ask the question. It was out there. and <laughs> okay. people. I had people emailing me about it, so I just wanted yeah. to get you on the record uh, on that. What, what do you – and the time that we have left here in the first segment – uh, when it comes to downtown revitalization, obviously you're for it, your opponent's for it uh, yeah. as well. Uh, is there a separation point between you and your opponent when it comes to downtown and may or maybe taxpayer money being spent on different projects downtown? Is there a difference between you and your opponent in your mind? Well, what I believe is that we ought to, the city ought to create the environment. Uh, you know, I think we've started work on the utilities, and um, I think the city should finish that. You know, as far as the difference between me and Mr. Geralt and myself will be, my perspective will come from a biz- being a business owner, and that's something, a perspective he does not bring to the job. And just under- understanding what's good for business and, and ha- how you do create that environment. So I would say the big biggest difference there is years of being a small business owner as opposed to him not being. Gotcha. When we uh, come back, we will continue our conversation. A lot more to get into, including uh, maybe future venues that the city of Lubbock may see. Uh, also, annexation, that's still a big topic that a lot of people are talking about. And uh, we'll, we may get in, even into the LPNL side of things as well. With Steve Massingale, candidate for District 4, Lubbock City Council. Chad HD Show News Talk 790 KFYO in studio. Steve Massingale, candidate for District 4, Lubbock City Council. Steve, yesterday in the uh, forum, uh, there was this, and, and I, I think some people have heard this chatter about a new arena uh, that uh, people hmm. are at least looking at possibly dirt, dirt, doing. dirt floor arena. Yeah, and uh, your your opponent yesterday brought up, well, there might need to be some county or city money. Y'all were talking about partnerships between city and county, mm-hmm. uh, and he mentioned city or county money, which translates into taxpayer money, right? Uh, going into a new, whether it be uh, dirt floor arena or arena in general, this would replace the Coliseum for the most part. Uh, in, in your mind, if there is a new arena that is uh, the ideas come up with, whether it be a dirt floor arena or just a a complete replacement for the Coliseum, how much taxpayer money should be spent on that on that issue on that project? 
Well, I guess I don't have the information right now to, to support city money going to that project. It's my understanding that that is a the, the the county is considering that, and I think there's some private dollars as well, which, which I support that. Um, you know, the county apparently during the snowstorm had some buildings damaged beyond repair that they use for some indoor events. And then we also have the topic everyone loves to talk about, seems like in the last couple of weeks, is the auditorium. And, you know, the auditorium has outlived its useful life. Let's just let's just call call it what it is. Yeah. And it's time, and, and I understand it's going to take a, a referendum, but, you know, I think we need to consider that because uh, we've got some private investment that's going to have created the LEPA facility, and that's going to relieve some of that. You know, you've got a remodeled civic center uh, that, that's going to help uh, alleviate some of that as well. The, the auditorium's been redone. And then if they can, you know, if, if the county is able and decides, you, you know, with the fairgrounds, that's their project, and that's something that's always been their project, and I'm sure that they can justify that through revenues or, 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 or you know, profits from events, then I would be supportive of them doing that. But I don't see a reason for the city to be involved in that at this point in time. What is the the line for you when it comes to public-private partnerships? Uh, we've heard of this downtown hotel, uh, even though there are other hotels that have gone up without city money going into. Uh, this would be, I guess, a larger hotel. It would be right. maybe connected or close to uh, the Civic Center. In the past, they have brought up the figure of $22 million being kicked over uh, for this, you know, uh, for for the taxpayer money being spent on this uh, project, is there a line that you draw and say that's too much taxpayer money, or should there be no public private partnerships? So where do you draw the line there? I, I think some of these public private partnerships can be successful, and I think the Overton's been, the, the 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 banquet side of the Overton has has been successful. Um, Regarding the hotel on the Civic Center property, and, and just to be clear to your listeners, that the proposal is there on the northeast corner of the Civic Center. Uh, you know what it what, what I'm going to look at. It's it's, it's more than the, the than just the city side of it. It's going to be is it a good business deal? And I want to see on the private side, how much skin they have in the game. And we haven't determined that yet. So it's really hard to make a call on that. But when you're looking at these public-private partnerships, uh, they can be successful. They they can be uh, formatted in a way that are, are not a drain on taxpayer funds. And then – but you've got to see how much skin the private side has in the game because the last thing you want to do is get involved as a governmental entity. And if these – you know – if it's not working out for the private side and they bail on you, then you've got a real problem. And so you want to make sure that relationship is structured in a way that there's they've, they've got enough investment that they're in it for the long haul and you want them to make that thing profitable because – it, 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 it's a tourism, you know, it's a, it's a component of tourism. And I think that, um, you know, we want to promote that at every angle we can get because that's good for business. I mean, I'm a retailer. I want them to come in and visit. I want them to come in and spend money, and that's good for everybody. Visiting with Steve Maskingale, candidate for District 4, Lubbock City Council. Uh, yesterday, LPNL came up, the future of LPNL, ERCOT. Uh, I think you're in support of that move to, to ERCOT. Uh, you also brought up you know, future changes maybe that LPNL should be making. Uh, you brought up the, the wireless technology. Mm-hmm. Uh, get into that a little bit. Well, it was, it was brought up in the context of conservation. Uh, when you look at that, uh, I, that will be an investment at some point in time down the road, and that's going to be an incremental investment. I don't think that's something we can install all at once, but there is a savings that comes from that. Uh, if you can imagine, the city pays people to walk down alleys all day long every day to read meters, and there's human error involved in that. But in regards to conservation, I don't think we're ever going to be in a world that we don't, from this point forward, aren't going to be conscious of conservation. But if you're concerned with your water bill and you want to make sure you're not using excessive water, if there was a wireless meter installed, you would get a text alert to say, hey, Mr. Hasty, you're about to get in. You've watered your yard so much. Or you're on a week-long vacation and you get alert that you're using excessive water. Maybe you have a leak you need to be alerted to. So there's advantage, advantages to that. I guess my point about that is some point in the future, our city has got to consider that, and that's one of these pieces that I've talked about 
moving into the 21st century. Yes, it will be an investment, but it, there will be savings reaped from that. Is that something where LP&L bills will rise because of that investment, or should it be done so in a way where LP&L bills don't go up because we're going to have that investment? I'd love it to be a situation where LP&L has the reserve someday that we're able to purchase it where it doesn't have an impact on bills. But yet to be determined, I mean, there's just – there's a lot of moving pieces in that, and to go back, you know, the, the electric meters are easy to install. It's the water meters that are the problem, and so, you know, you don't want to do one without the other because then you're still paying someone to read the water meters. So you're probably starting with new builds or new constructions and uh, uh, ramping up from there. But there's a lot of communities that have seen a lot of success from this, and it, it actually furthers their conservation efforts. And the question yesterday was, how do you alleviate concerns with conservation? And that would be one of them. I mean, we all know, and I've advocated for, we all communicate on this smartphone all the time. Right. Uh, I also advocate for the fact that we ought to be able to pay our LP&L bill here. And we ought to be able to pay our water bill here. Mm -hmm. And if we want to talk to codes department, we ought to be able to just click right in and send them an email. So we got to move our city into the 21st century. Is that something that you anticipate if elected that you would like to, uh, to to like to lead that effort at City Hall? Yeah, I, I absolutely would. I mean, I want us to, I want to utilize technology where it creates savings and also creates a more efficient city government, but at the same time creates a more customer friendly city government. Uh, when it comes to uh, annexation, uh, you saw the vote, uh, what was it, last week, I mm -hmm. think, from the Lubbock City Council uh, where they will allow folks to opt out uh, of uh, being annexed uh, in, in those areas. What were your thoughts on that vote? If you were on the City Council, how would you have voted? 20 years seems like a long time to me. Um, you know, I I think this annexation could, again, be handled in a better manner. I uh I don't. I, I like to operate under a philosophy of no surprises. So I don't. I don't. It doesn't matter what the situation is. I'm going to do everything I can not to surprise you with something. And so if you know, we know. I mean, Chad, you and I can sit down with a map, and in about a couple of hours, we could say, you know what? In the next ten years, we're probably going to be looking at annexing this stuff. And so let's let, let let's let those people know now. And that way the realtors will know and say, if you purchase this property right outside the city limits, just get ready. It's likely you're going to be annexed. And then once we're communicating in that manner without surprises, then I think you methodically uh, look at annexation. Growing cities have to look at annexation. The other thing we've got to do when we annex is we've got to follow through with our commitments. I got a call from a constituent this week. says, I got annexed in 94 and I still don't have a fire plug. Hmm. We've got to follow through with these things. So uh, I think there are better ways to handle annexation. I support annexation, but I think you can do it where it's not so divisive. Tell folks where they can find more information about you online. You can find us on Facebook at Steve Massengill for City Council, and then you can go to our website at stevefor.lubbock.com. All right, early vote starts on Monday, and we'll have Steve uh, back in studio, I think, next week. Sounds great. All right.